So I'm here in Melbourne today, um, straight off the G6 stage, as it's now known. Um, six is the new eight. I'm here again with Arno Franz. Um, Arno, you and I haven't been sat face to face like this post a G8 discussion as it was then since 2009 yeah. and definitely some shifts today uh, I think in some of the feedback that we're getting from the audience and a vibe now we're post GFC we were right in the midst of it when you and I last uh, spoke straight after one of these debates yeah. firstly thank you for being here again today Pleasure. Um, I want to just talk about a couple of the comments that you made here today as always you have a strong view on a number of these areas and I want to pick up on um, Firstly, let's talk about the mid-market, which is where Martin began the discussion today. And I thought actually you made um, a, a fair point that, that nobody else really recognised within the group that there is a lot of attempt, in your opinion, mm. um, in the vendor community as a whole at the market to, to actually recognise and close the gap mm. Mm. Um, on, the, on the client's needs mm. uh, and expectations with regard to what is out there in the market mm. for smaller mm. players. Mm. Mm. Can you give us an example of a, a couple of the sorts of things that you're seeing, perhaps from other peers of yours in the vendor community right now, that mm -hmm. really are focused on that, that yeah. market? So let, let me respond to that by first talking about the context of why that's come about. If you go back, say, maybe five plus years, there was quite an appreciable gap between what service providers could provide mm -hmm. and what clients wanted. And very much in those days, it was a game of lift and shift. Mm -hmm. If we can lift it and do it cheaper somewhere else, that made a lot of sense. Unfortunately, it was very commoditized and it didn't help clients who wanted something more than just an ordinary day-to-day, day-in, day-out service. So there was a real gap. And what happened was clients voted with their feet. And so service providers were not getting those large engagements, particularly around the business process space. And I think what's happened through the GFC, two things have occurred. One, the service providers have taken those lessons on from five plus years ago and they've re-energised and started to reinvent themselves using more technologies such as what cloud offers and are now driving a platform, a platform initiative within their organisations for clients which will appeal both to large clients but also to mid clients and that's the key aspect. So there's a real attempt to then close the gap with the client's requirements. Client's requirements have not changed essentially, they still want more than just a day-to-day -day lift and shift. They do want that. They have wanted that for some time. Now, finally, the vendors have actually turned around. To give you a great example, the current shift, complete turnaround in Infosys. Infosys, who are probably, I would say, the top Indian heritage provider, have now started to drive a new initiative in their organisation to provide platform by function to clients, HR, finance, etc., within industry, etc bringing together industry expertise, functional expertise and technology expertise and giving it as a one-stop shop. Very clever from a marketing and very clever from a grabbing the client and holding on to them from a stickiness point of view, but absolutely attempting to address this issue of the richness of functionality beyond the scale and economy of just lift and shift. So what are we talking about when we say mid-market? Here in Australia, obviously, we, we do tend to see a um, a very a very special market that operates here and here alone from on many levels culturally in terms of size of organization in terms of numbers of organizations yep. what specifically does does that mean to you when we talk about those small to medium enterprises? Well, I think there's still quite a range even within that. Uh, even within a country like Australia, you'll have some organisations, say in the utility sector, who are doing probably billions of dollars a year in revenue, but they would be considered to be mid-market on a global scale. Based on FTE, is that? Based on FTEs and based on revenue. Right. So, But they're immediately appealable to uh, some of the service providers who are starting to drive this more platform approach that is segmented down to a function you know, within an industry, etc. Or you can get down to clients here in Australia which are less than a billion dollars in revenue and less than you know, that amount of uh, FTEs. Even they are of a direct appeal. So there's quite an interesting range of the below, I would say, 10 to $8 billion range of companies in Australia that would be considered mid-tier at a global level and would be an immediate target for those service providers. And there's quite a lot of them. There is quite a lot here in this country. And what about those customers themselves or those potential clients? Yep. Do you feel that their view of shared service and outsourcing and how relevant it is to them, is that's what's shifting as well? Post-GFC, 
I suppose really the question is, is now shared services a need to have rather than a nice to have in this part of the world? I think what's happened during the GFC, organisations that have got through the GFC have turned around and they've had a look and say, we really need to change our cost base. How are we going to do that? And so they've gone through, most of them have gone through some sort of process of self-analysis or using external parties, primarily based around data and benchmarking. And they're coming through with a strategy that is either shared services or a combination of shared services and outsourcing. And ultimately shared services is just a form of sourcing, as is outsourcing, as is captive centres. So they've analysed themselves and they've come up with a preferred service delivery model because they want to create something that is both cost sustainable but also capacity sustainable. Can it go up and can it go down? The lessons learned from the GFC, I need to ramp down and I need to have a flexible cost base. And the final one is capability. You know, capability is a big issue. We're, we're still in a very highly competitive environment, whatever the industry segment is. And so enhancing capability is quite important in order to support and drive the business. People keep on forgetting about that, but it's not just about cost and it isn't just about capacity, but it's also about capability. And I think that's part of where the uh, resource constraint issues are starting to bear problems for organisations and that's why they need to look to external vendors to bring the capability into their organisations in some sort of partnership, although that's not an ideal word to use. So essentially we're looking at the GFC as being a wake-up call for many people now? Very much so, very much so. My cost base is not sustainable if I go through another crisis. I've actually had some crises. If we look here in Australia, you've had the, the floods in Queensland, Victoria, the cyclone, etc. They're quite devastating for a number of client organisations. People don't understand. That after the first month of floods in Queensland, 34,000 full-time jobs just disappeared. Right? And all of the people that depend on those jobs obviously you know, are not doing too well. So clients who, whose industries, tourism, airline industry, you know, a discretionary retail industry, all of them are looking, saying, how do I make sure I've got this flexible cost base in order to ride through the rough and tumble of either an economic situation, such as the GFC, or a natural disaster, such as we've seen up in Queensland. Let's talk about flexible cost base then for a second and tie that back into the employment market, yep. um, which leads us nicely into um, another polling question that we had in the G6 today, which was around salary inflation. Some very different views on the panel mm, with regard mm. to that. You had a very strong view. You mentioned that there's a two-speed economy yep. essentially happening yep. here in Australia right yep. now. And I think you said that nobody, in your view, would be setting um, a 4% increase in salary inflation just based on the fact that it's not possible right now to be sustainable. Correct. Some of your colleagues felt very differently about that. I know certainly offline, one comment was made to me that actually this is Australia and that's what people expect and it will always happen. Can you give us the counter argument to that? Clearly you've got some strong views. Sustain it for us, back that up. Certainly, well first of all, one thing to recognise about the economy in Australia is there's a significant portion of the economy is government and government services based, whether it's state or federal. They are kind of locked in to regular increases, albeit that they are government budgetary constraints and issues, etc., that have to flex those budgets. But generally, most public servants enjoy a 3 to 4% increase on a regular basis, right? That's part of their general award conditions, etc. So an expectation is there? On the public sector side, I would say absolutely yes. But if you go into the private sector side, I think the expectation is ill-founded. Uh, why? All you need to do is look at the profit reporting season that we just had concluded a couple of months ago. And it was a pretty mixed bag of results. Yes, there were some high flyers, some of the banks, in fact all of the banks, and the resources companies. But even the banks, even the banks are very cost constrained. The cost of their money, the cost of capital, that is their lifeblood, is not sustained by deposits here in Australia, but they have to borrow money from overseas. There is huge cost pressure going on in the banks at this point in time, even though some of them are going through major changes in terms of information technology or shared services, the cost pressure is quite significant. They cannot be translated into 4% across the board increases for their staff. If you look at all the under industry sectors, it's almost identical. Their profits are not there to sustain an increase in their labour costs. So there has to be less people doing more work. I mean, I spoke with a client yesterday, they ha and a very senior person in the organisation, in a large iconic organisation in this country, he had not had a pay rise in five years. 
And for me, that is more the norm of what's going on uh, in this economy to speed uh, than what was being put forward in terms of shared services operations wanting to budget for three and four. I mean, I think, yes, as a starting position, they want to give something. And in the public sector, you probably can do that because those budgets are dealt with quite differently than they are in the private sector because there isn't a profit issue there. You just cut down certain other things. But in the private sector, as I said, I think you're dreaming. You know, a three to four percent increase in pay is not forthcoming generally across the board. What would be your response then to those that say that talent, and we do have a war on talent in Australia, clearly yeah. everyone agrees on that. What would you say to those that say the talent will simply go elsewhere if that's not actually fulfilled, regardless and, of whether it should be or not? And where else would they go? Um, to be truthful, let's have a look at what's happening in America. We still have an employment just under 10 per cent, just under 10 per cent for the first time in well over a year. Um, it's not a pretty picture there. If we go to the UK, it's probably even an uglier picture. Uh, the cutback of government services, very high personal tax rates, which I think are going to kick in in July this year, if I'm not mistaken. The only one that's showing any real growth and really sustainability in the European market is probably Germany. So if you're a great German-speaking, culturally aware person, off you go and you'll find yourself a job. So I think, you know, the prospects of actually talent draining out of the country is actually quite minimal. In fact, what we're seeing is the reverse. We're seeing some expats saying, I want to come back, thanks very much, because where I've been for the last few years has gone sour. So that's the reality. But there is a squeeze on talent and there is a squeeze in certain areas. What we are seeing is people do move from company to company because companies are wanting to acquire talent and it's through that process that they're actually getting an increase in compensation, not by actually staying within the organisation themselves per se. Great tip there for any German speaking Australians. <laughs> I'm sure they'll love that. Oh no, I just want to wrap up today by talking for a minute. There was obviously some, some highly um, charged questions coming mm. from the audience today. One lady in particular made a comment about um, whether or not clients were viewed as, I think her word was... Exploitive? Exploitive, yeah. In your view, you know, how can the client themselves actually make for a better partnership? Let's talk reality now. Obviously, everybody is in this for their, for their own objectives. There's certainly money to be made from the vendor community, and that's certainly what has to be taken into account here. Sure. But at the same time, there needs to be a win-win. How yeah. best do you actually see that happening so that nobody does ever walk away feeling as though they have been exploited? I, th I think it's a great uh, question because uh, no vendor or consultant uh, wants to work with a client that is a bad client to work with. And what do I mean by a bad client? I mean someone who's uneducated, someone who is very difficult to connect with, someone who's very difficult to engage with. Nobody wants that because that's, that's a life of hell on the service provider side as much as it might be a life of hell on the client side. So I think service providers ultimately, they're driven by profit, they're driven by revenue growth, etc. But they also need to, there needs to be a match call it a match made in heaven between the client and the service provider. It's just as important for the service provider to understand where the client is culturally and where the client is in their business cycle. Is this a cost only opportunity? Then let's play it like that and let's be clear about it. Let's not pretend it's about innovation and let's not pretend it's about something else. But the client themselves has to actually step up. They have to still take responsibility for what they're doing and they have to take responsibility in having the capability to manage an external relationship or to manage a shared services entity which they may not have the capability for today. So the issue there is, do they recognise they have a gap? If they don't recognise they have a gap, then they're a bad client to work with. If they recognise they have a gap, that's halfway through the battle and at least they can do something about saying, we know we have a gap in capability, now how do we close that gap? Be prepared to take advice, be prepared to be educated and be prepared to change. If the client isn't prepared to change, then it will be a relationship forged in hell and a very unpleasant one for a long time. So service providers want educated, well-informed clients who take advice and clients that can push them. You know, clients that can push them to go to the next level. They do want that ultimately in a client, someone who can be very engaging and, and you know, produce a fantastic relationship and produce fantastic results. The trouble is, does the client understand where their capability gap is? So in summary, of the Australian market at the moment, uh, in the words of Arno Franz, 
We are expecting our customers to step up to change. Correct. To be smarter customers. Yep. Um, we're also expecting to see potentially some expats coming home. Definitely. Um, and lastly, don't expect to pay a rise anytime soon unless you're in the public sector. Correct. <laughs> Thank Arno, you. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed G6 as much as we did, and we hope to see you again. Thanks, Emma.